What's going on guys? This is Poger coming at you with another video. So I'm going to be covering another game that gets a lot of negative reception and I'm going to go through it and see if it's actually a game that deserves that negative feedback or not. Is it really a bad game or is it underrated? Let's find out. So let me ask you guys something. How do you get this into this? Well, you don't. If you wanted to play Pac-Man or another game in the arcade, you had to go to the arcade. Playing games at home was unheard of at the time, but there was one console that maybe just maybe could pull it off. The 2600. In 1980, Atari acquired the license to port Space Invaders by Taito to the 2600. And this was huge because it was the first time an arcade game was ever licensed to a home console. And it sold really well, and it drove sales of the console by four times. Think about that for a second. For a couple years, an Atari home console was the only way you could play Space Invaders if you didn't want to go to the arcade. So when the opportunity to port Pac-Man to the 2600 arose, Atari jumped on it. They hired Todd Fry to single-handedly develop the game from the ground up. Making the game would pose as a challenge, as Fry was not provided with any arcade design specifications whatsoever, so therefore he could only learn about the game through playing it. This meant that he couldn't study the source code of the arcade Pac-Man and try to emulate it. Not only that, but the 2600's hardware was far more limited than the arcade Pac-Man system board. To put this in comparison, the arcade Pac-Man has 2K of main RAM, 2K of video RAM, and 16K of read-only memory. The Atari 2600, on the other hand, has 128 bytes of RAM, no video RAM whatsoever, and 4K of read-only memory. That's 32 times less RAM and 3 times less ROM to utilize. However, the 2600 version of Space Invaders was also downgraded from the arcade version, and it was still genuinely praised and sold over 2 million copies its first year released. So how did Pac-Man turn out? Not exactly as expected. The game sounds, appears, and feels different from the arcade Pac-Man. Pac-Man doesn't even look up or down when he moves, he only faces left or right the whole time. The game flickers like crazy too, making the ghosts look indistinguishable from each other. The collision detection is bad too. In the original Pac-Man, the ghost had to be completely covering you in order for it to count as a death. But here, the ghost can barely touch you and you die. The game sounds horrible even for Atari standards, nothing like the original. The level design is also very uncreative and doesn't resemble the original Pac-Man at all. There are gameplay modes that allow you to adjust Pac-Man's speed and the ghost speed, but what's annoying is that you have to look at the manual in order to see what each number means, otherwise you won't know what game mode it is. But this isn't the game's fault, many early 2600 games did this too, because in-game menus weren't a thing back then. But it's cool that there are different game modes to give it more replayability. So what's the upside? Well, it's Pac-Man at home. Despite many people criticizing the game, it was still the best-selling 2600 game of all time with over 7 million copies. People were excited about playing Pac-Man at home, even if it was bad. It was the only option people had at the time. So here's the big question. Did hardware limitations prevent this game from being better, or could Fry have done a better job? While developing the game, Fry had various obstacles he had to get through. For one, a 4K ROM cartridge was used, which severely limited what he could do. Now, 8K cartridges were right around the corner, but wasn't quite available yet. Atari decided to stick with 4K because it was cheaper. Fry had to make some changes in order to fit the game in a 4K cartridge. The levels, for an example, 
were given a repetitive look in order to save space, because it took up less lines of code to repeat patterns rather than to come up with a new board. Think about it this way. It takes up less space on a piece of paper to just write 1 times 10 to the 12th power in scientific notation, rather than just write 1 trillion. Now during development, Fry had to make the background blue rather than black, not because of hardware limitations, but because Atari only allowed space type games to have a black background. Remember how the ghosts flickered a lot? Fry planned on making a flicker management system that would have reduced flickering in the game, but Atari didn't seem to care about the issue because they just wanted the game to be released quickly. One feature that might have hurt Pac-Man's potential was the fact that its two-player functionality was kept in. This meant that an extra 23 bytes was required to store the second player's game difficulty, remaining lives, and score. With the 2600 only having 128 bytes of memory, the extra 23 bytes could have potentially been used for something better instead of two players. However, Fry prioritized keeping the two-player functionality from the arcade version because he thought it would be important for consumers at home. Despite high anticipation, when the game was released it got a lot of negative reception. Electronic Games Magazine released its first ever bad review for an Atari game, stating, Considering the anticipation and considerable time the Atari designers had to work on it, it's astonishing to see a home version of a classic arcade contest so devoid of what gave the original its charm. Phil Wisewell of Video Games criticized the game's graphics, calling it Flicker Man. We know that Fry didn't have many resources to work with, but the question still stands. Could this have been a better game? This question would actually be answered over 30 years later. In 2014, a user known as Dintar816 made a thread on the Atari Age forum stating he was working on a new homebrew Pac-Man game. He posted a YouTube video of the gameplay but didn't post the ROM file yet. Members of the site were impressed with what they saw and they wanted to try it out themselves. A few days later, he finally dumped the ROM. Here's the latest version, made in February of 2015. The final result is stunning. It has the same level layout as the arcade, the graphics look near identical to the original, and it even sounds very close to the arcade version. Remember how in the 2600 version Pac-Man only faced left and right? The new version, titled Pac-Man 2600 4K, fixed that problem. The flickering? The new version flickers as well, but the ghosts are still much more distinguishable than in Fry's version. To my surprise, this game even has the intermissions from the original arcade, which the original 2600 version did not have. Dintar's new Pac-Man game was made for the same console as Fry's game, therefore the game had to be made under the same hardware limitations. So, how was Dintar able to pull this off? Well, for one, there's no two-player functionality. Dintar also had access to a few more resources than Fry did, including a program that allowed him to accurately produce sound that was identical to the arcade. Not only those things, but Dintar worked very close with the Atari Age community to well optimize the game by removing unnecessary code and accepting people's suggestions. Numerous times in his thread, he would make a comment like, I saved about 20 bytes. Each update he would make, he would be closer and closer to shaving off a few more bytes so that he could reserve the extra space for things like intermissions and the game over text. The work that he did was truly remarkable. Does that mean that Todd Fry's efforts shouldn't be accounted for? Not necessarily. Fry not only had restrictions from Atari themselves, but he didn't have access to near as many resources back then that Dintar had 30 years later. In 2018, Dintar came out with yet another Pac-Man homebrew final release called Pac-Man 2600 8K, which featured double the amount of space. 
This game isn't too different from his previous game, but features a few upgrades, the biggest one being a title screen. The graphics and sound are also a little sharper, and closely resembles the arcade version than Pac-Man 2600 4K. It's worth mentioning that Fry was actually introduced to Pac-Man 2600 8K. He made the statement, This is really cool. It's actually really thought-provoking and a little depressing. I mean, what's depressing is that he did some stuff that I just didn't think of that is just really useful. He also made the statement, He's got this flicker manager. When three things are in the same vertical region, they do the minimum amount of flicker. I started working on that algorithm, but I gave up because I ran out of time. I give a lot of props to Fry for being so transparent about the game, admitting it was better and even giving it his thumbs up. So even though the 2600 version of Pac-Man is bad, I have a little more respect for it knowing the history behind it and the lack of resources that Todd Fry had when making it. Later on, Atari would make Ms. Pac-Man for the 2600, and it fixed a majority of the problems that its predecessor had. With that said, those are my thoughts. Thank you so much for watching the video. Feel free to leave a like on this video, drop a comment, and subscribe if you haven't already. More content is coming. That being said, have a good one you guys.